Hi, I'm Terry Tomlin. In this series, we take a journey inside the Florida Aquarium to join wildlife experts, educators, and students just like you on a mission to entertain and educate while inspiring stewardship for the natural environment. Together, using science and research, we'll increase our knowledge and expose some myths by venturing inside the fascinating world of sharks, sea turtles, oysters, fishes of the wetlands, and marine mammals. These species all help inspire us to protect and conserve the world's priceless marine animals and their environments. So let's take the plunge on a learning adventure that explores these amazing wonders of our undersea world. This is the Florida Aquarium's Tanks to the Ocean, an educational web series brought to you by the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. Hello, I'm Eric Hovland, curator of the Florida Aquarium and all-around shark guy. Thank you for joining us for today's episode. We're going to be exploring the fascinating world of sharks. Since before the time when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, sharks have inhabited the world's oceans. In the nearly 400 million years since, they've evolved into hundreds of diverse species. Science is only now beginning to understand how special these animals are and the vital role they play in the health of our planet's marine ecosystems. All right, well, one of the things we're learning today is what sharks are. Sharks are apex predators. And what that means is that as the food web goes, they're one of the big daddies in that whole intricate scenario. Sharks are not brutal, mindless killing machines. They're not the animal we saw in the movie Jaws. Sharks are pretty selective about what they eat, when they eat, and how they hunt. Sharks are still wild animals, but animals that behave like sharks should. The cool thing about sharks is the diversity, not just of sizes, but types and numbers of sharks. In fact, there are about 400 known species of sharks in our oceans around the world. That's 400 that we know of so far, and they can live from extremely deep water to the shallows, to the tropics, to the icy waters of the Arctic. Let's say you're pretty unlikely to see most of them, but if you're lucky enough to see something like a goblin shark or a saw shark or a mega mouth shark with a glow in a dark mouth, it just shows you how incredibly diverse shark species are. Hey, let's not forget about the rays. The rays are basically what we scientists refer to as flat sharks. They're really not that different, and there's about 400 species of them as well, which even includes the sawfish and the huge manta ray about 22 feet across. Not all sharks are huge predators. Let's talk about the smallest shark in the ocean. It's called the dwarf lantern shark. Now this is a shark that's found in a pretty small range, somewhat rare. It's found in the Caribbean waters off of Venezuela and Colombia, and I should note, very deep waters. Starting around 900 feet down to about 1,500 feet. It's about a quarter mile. An enormous, an absolutely largest dwarf lantern shark that you would see was coming at a whopping eight inches long. That's right, eight inches of tiny shark power, tip to tip. So, still a shark, but one of the largest animals that's ever lived on Earth is also a shark, even though its name is whale shark. Whale sharks have the size of whales, and they feed like the baleen whales in that they filter their food out of the water, but they are 100% shark. These sharks are known for their large size, but they do eat some of the smallest foods in the oceans, krill and plankton and maybe small fish that they sift out with their very large mouths. Now whale sharks, unlike the dwarf lantern shark before, are found around the world in tropical oceans. They have a polka dotted body and they can easily be seen even from helicopters. So just to give you some perspective, we've got dwarf lantern shark, but I'm gonna take a little trip over this direction while Tristan helps me as the tail as I take the head of this whale shark, not 10, not 20, not 30, but we're talking 42 feet is the largest whale shark on record from head where I'm standing to the tip of the tail where Tristan is helping me out on the other end. 
That is one big animal, one of the biggest animals to ever live on the Earth, larger than some of the dinosaurs, and definitely one big shark. The largest fossil shark tooth on record is seven and a quarter inches. That means the shark was almost 60 feet long. That's about as big as a semi-truck. Hi, my name is John. I'm one of the biologists here at the Florida Aquarium. And what I want to talk to you today about is sharks. Not just any sharks, but the prehistoric sharks that used to live in Florida waters. The biggest one that actually lived in Florida waters was the Megalodon. We have right here several teeth from Megalodon. So this is about a five and a half inch meg tooth. They're really known for their serrations, really sharp, to cut through flesh, very pointed. They like to eat mammals. And what kind of mammals live in water? Well, dolphins. Uh, whales, dugons. Right here we have our dugon, dugon jaw. So all these are actually found with the fossils of the megalodontes. So we actually can tell what they ate from there. Here's a rib bone that actually has some marks from what scientists believe are from uh, megalodon teeth. Megalodon can actually get up to about 60 uh, feet long. Most of your semi trucks are about 60 feet long. Um, so that's a very big, long animal. As you can see back here, this one is a representation of what the shark jaw actually looked like. So I can actually be swallowed up by one without even a bite. This particular jaw is about seven to seven and a half feet wide. And that's when the animal is at its full bite. Um, speaking of bites, actually, um, megalodons actually have been recorded as the strongest bite in the uh, entire animal kingdom, even stronger than the T-Rex. Sharks replace their whole lower sets of teeth at a time. However, they lose many sets of teeth during their lifetime and often swallow the sets of teeth to conserve calcium. Well, with so many varieties of sharks, there are just as many varieties of teeth. And in fact, scientists and you can learn to identify sharks by looking at just their teeth. Since the only thing that's really left after a shark dies are the teeth, we've gotten very good at identifying them from the largest, the extinct megalodon tooth, to one of the smallest teeth and the best way I'm gonna be able to illustrate that is to put it right on top of that megalodon tooth. That's from a nurse shark, a nurse shark that's about eight feet long. We have teeth right here from great white sharks. We've all heard of them. So of course, several rows of those teeth, they're serrated like a knife that has serration so it can cut and cleave through, in this case, a seal or a sea lion, which is a common prey item for the big great white sharks. This tooth from a tiger shark, which is a fossil and millions of years old, you can see the change, the differences and the similarities. These serrations on the side help the animal saw. In the case of a great white sawing through the blubbery flesh of an elephant seal, it could weigh a ton. In the case of a tiger shark, sawing through that hard carapace, the shell of a sea turtle, cutting right through it like a can opener, get to the soft gooey center. In the case of the sand tiger, they have several rows of very sharp, very dagger-like teeth. If you look close, there's even little hooks on the side, so good for snagging their prey. So as they swim slowly up to a fish, they grab at it sideways, snag it, swallow it whole. However, if you're a nurse shark, you have several rows of very tiny teeth because the nurse shark is gonna grab Animals more like crabs and shrimp. Grab them, crunch them down, and again, swallow them whole. So as similar as they are, they're very different. But one thing that's very much the same is you can see several rows of teeth. Sh teeth for the shark are kind of like the knives for the chef. They need to be sharp all the time or they can't do their job. Well, a shark can't sharpen its own teeth. So instead, dull, old, or broken teeth fall out the front and there's always a new set of very sharp, and take my word for it, these are sharp, teeth that are growing in behind and waiting to replace them. Sharks are hunters, and you can't hunt a plant. So one of the popular questions is, are sharks herbivorous? Do sharks eat plants? Do any sharks eat plants? And the answer is no. Sharks are always on the move. They've got to have energy levels to maintain that, and plants just aren't going to cut it. So a shark can't graze on plants. The plant material just won't meet the nutritional needs of sharks. So they all need a protein source. So with that said, sharks around the world eat a variety of different foods. A tiger shark is sometimes called the garbage can of the sea. 
because it will eat anything including animal carcasses, tin cans, car tires, and other garbage. My name is Megan. I work in the commissary. It's our aquarium's kitchen, and I am prepping our shark food uh, for the week. They eat three times a week, and um, it's easier for me to prep it in, uh, for the week so I can see what they're getting each feeding, so I make sure I get a varied diet. Um, they also get supplemented with uh, shark vitamins, and we have small bonnethead sharks that will require a slightly smaller vitamin. And then for our big guys, like our sand tigers, they will obviously get the larger vitamins here. And all the fish will get stuffed with at least one of them, if not two, depending on the dietary needs of that particular animal. This fish is called a bonito. Um, it's just a small, uh, very, actually a varied sized fish. Um, these are actually the smaller kind that I usually get. They also get things like ladyfish hole, and they'll get um, a little blue runner later this week. We are paying attention to the weight to maintain them. Uh, sharks in the wild, and like most predators in the wild, will binge because they're opportunistic, so if the opportunity approaches, they eat. Um, here in captivity, we need to monitor that a lot better. They don't have quite as much room as they would in the wide open ocean, so they're not burning as many calories, so we need to make sure that they are eating and burning um, approximately the same amount as they would be in the wild. So we do take their diet down. Um, it's uh, reduced, but it's about 1% of their body weight per shark per week per feeding. So um, uh, right now I am feeding about eight to nine pounds of fish out to our sharks. And each uh, shark will probably get like three or four whole fish or um, three or four halves of fish. And it's really dependent on them. If they're um, a little hungrier one day, um, we'll bump up the diet for the next feeding. Um, and if they're not, we'll reduce it. So it's a constant communication between the biologist and myself about um, what their needs are. Sharks have been known to jump completely out of water, usually facing upwards to catch fast moving meals like seals or sea lion. We're gonna be getting in the water with our sand tiger sharks. While that might sound kind of intimidating by itself, we're really in there to help out the sharks where Jen, my director, and I are gonna be swimming up to the sharks and getting them used to us. So we don't want the sharks to associate divers and people with being afraid or anything negative, but sometimes we need to get up close and personal with our sharks for their health. That means we may need to do annual physicals where we wanna move the shark into a medical area and give him an exam, just like you'd probably get once a year yourself. But in this case, we may need to touch the shark. So today is gonna to be about desensitizing. So just like you don't run up to a dog and pet it, especially a, a wild dog or a dog you don't know, it doesn't know you, today we're gonna to be slowly approaching the sharks. We're gonna come up to the side of the sharks so that they can see us coming. And then I'm gonna very gently sweep water towards the shark's tail so they can feel that. And then also touch the sharks in the back half of the body with the tail. Jen will be watching and she'll have a long pole that can also be used to help conduct or steer the sharks if we need to. But for the most part, this is about the sharks knowing that we're their neighbors, we're in the water with them from time to time, and they have nothing to fear from us. But then when it comes time to do their medical work or their physicals, they'll be, well, more or less used to us getting up close and personal with them. Just like after a while, that dog is fine with you walking right up and touching him. But make no mistake, these are not dogs. It takes a lot more conditioning, a lot more time in the water to get these sharks used to our presence. Our sand tiger sharks and sharks in aquariums around the world help us tell a very different tale about sharks. It's not the movie version where they're the predator chasing down people and eating everything in sight. The conservation message is that sharks are very important to our environments. We really have to start thinking about them in a different way. Their numbers are dwindling. They're exceptionally important to our environment. They really keep the oceans in check and when the oceans are healthy, the world is healthy, and you and I are healthy. What better reason to protect sharks? Plus, they're just awesome. A shark's liver is coated in oil, helping the shark stay buoyant in the water. Hi, my name is Michelle Anderson, and I work in the education department here at the Florida Aquarium. My job is to hang out with the animals all day long and teach people about them, including my favorite animal, the sharks. Well, I've learned so much working at the Florida Aquarium and my schooling, I wanted to get a first-hand experience with the sharks to really, truly understand these beautiful creatures. So I visited the Bimini Biological Field Station in the Bahamas, aka the Shark Lab.
The first day I got there, I was thrown in the water with 20 to 30 actively feeding Caribbean reef sharks. As they swarmed all around me, I realized that sharks do not want to get people and they have no interest in eating us as their prey. You could see the sharks come up to you and look at you. They were curious, but they saw you as another predator in the ocean, something much too large to eat. As I swam back to the boat, I looked down below me. I saw two to three Caribbean reef sharks that were much larger than myself swimming right below me. One of them came straight towards me. I looked at the shark and I scooted back a little bit. As soon as I did, he swam away from me. I never would have guessed that little five foot me could scare an eight foot Caribbean reef shark. I love these sharks and I realized that having a firsthand experience like that only helps me to educate people about the sharks. Coming back to the Florida Aquarium with this information has helped me to open so many eyes about these amazing creatures. More people are killed by bee stings and lightning than shark attacks. Shark skin was once used as sandpaper. Hi, my name is Tristan and I'm coming to you from the education department at the Florida Aquarium. And I hear you guys are just about to become shark experts, so let's take a minute to review. We've learned today that there are about 400 diverse species of sharks. Now, sharks are very important to the ocean ecosystem because they help control populations. Not only do they keep those in balance, but they do so by eating weak and sick animals. Although that doesn't sound too good for us, it helps the ocean by reducing the spread of disease and also overpopulation. So speaking of overpopulation, let's look at our ocean ecosystem in front of me. On one side we have sharks, on the other side we have a variety of prey items. Now what do you think would happen if we overfished sharks? Let's find out. If we start to remove sharks from our ocean ecosystem, you're gonna notice that we're no longer in balance. This will probably lead to an overpopulation of prey items, which means they're probably not gonna survive because they're not gonna have enough food to eat. Now to look at it from a slightly different angle, we can check out our sustainable Jenga. Over here, if you look at it as sharks being on the base of the food chain and everything else on top. Now, sharks are top predators, so this might seem a little bit backwards, but they do help support the food chain. So what do you think is gonna happen if we start to remove some of our sharks? Maybe due to overfishing. As you can see, it's gonna start to be less balanced. And eventually, without enough sharks, your whole food chain might collapse. So to help maintain healthy ecosystems around the world, it is important to have diversity. It's what we referred to earlier as biodiversity. Now here in Florida, my guess is most of you have enjoyed outdoor activities like fishing, scuba diving, snorkeling, or boating. In order to enjoy those activities for years to come, we wanna help maintain the biodiversity that we currently have. And I think Dr. Seuss said it best when he said, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. Please join my friends in learning about what you can do. We work to educate ourselves and others on all things sharks. One other thing you can do is share your shark knowledge with others. Another thing you can do is participate in a beach cleanup. One thing you can do is visit your local aquarium. Another thing you can do is educate yourself and your family how to make smart seafood choices. Don't be afraid to ask questions when purchasing seafood. Sustainable seafood means healthy ocean. So what will you do? This series is presented by the Florida Aquarium with generous support from the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. We thank you for watching. For more information or to donate, please visit us in downtown Tampa or online.